I get a lot of questions about this um, from people who suspect that they may be suffering from this condition. And we're gonna talk about iliac artery endofibrosis and my experience in dealing with it. Now, those three big fancy words are basically a description of a vascular problem or a vascular complication affecting primarily elite cyclists, but I have seen it in plenty of amateurs as well, or those who do really large volume on the bike. So if you're riding a heck of a lot, you should listen up because this one is a, we think it's a surprisingly common affliction at a, at a subclinical level. So at a level where it's not causing enormous issues, but enough issues that you should be on the lookout for this. So a little bit of background anatomy about iliac artery endofibrosis. So the way that your circulatory system works is a descending aorta comes down off your heart and it bifurcates, it splits down here in the back of your guts into two different arteries called the descending aortic uh, sorry, the descending iliac arteries. They split into the left and right leg. They then track across the front of your hip joint in very, very close communication to the front of the hip joint and right next to your hip flexor, your psoas muscle. They're really, really deep down on the front of the joint. They kink and bend and then they curl around your quadriceps and then down in your legs, they split again and they form a cup. They, they branch off a couple of times and, and delve down into your femoral arteries. So these are the primary sort of circulatory systems which provide your legs with blood while you're exercising. Now, because it kinks and bends around your hip joint, it can develop thickening of the arterial wall, which is like the, the inside layer of it, um, from repetitive motion. So as that artery kinks and bends, as you flex your hip up and down, there's a, a section of the artery where all of this mechanical load is being repeatedly put across the wall of the artery. This kinking can repeatedly sort of disrupt the arterial wall, in particular the glycocalyx, which is like a, uh, a protein sort of chain wall on the inside of the artery. And this basically causes inflammation on the inside of the arterial wall from the mechanical traction effect, but it also causes then scar tissue to build up. And this is where the real problem is. The scar tissue builds up on the inner wall of the artery and it can then narrow the artery. And anytime you narrow one of the major arteries in your body that's feeding a particularly important structure, that structure struggles with blood flow. And in this case, it's gonna be your whole leg. And when we're exercising, it's gonna be the muscles in your leg primarily. The symptoms are things like burning pain down your thighs, um, sensations of really severe pressure buildup while you're exercising, swelling obviously in your thighs and increase of, uh, of, of what we call um, claudication, which is basically a lack of blood flow through the legs. You can get weakness, you can get cramping in the affected leg. Occasionally it's symmetrical, it's both sides, but a lot of the time one of them will go before the other one. So you're, you're most likely to have this on one side first. These symptoms annoyingly are quite similar to what you're going to get on the bike when you're exercising hard anyway. So a lot of people will, you know, you're doing VO2 efforts and you say, well, my legs burn and you know, I, I feel pressure and discomfort and pain when I'm doing VO2 efforts anyway, which is technically true. What you need to look for is a, a reduction in your power output. So if you've been training really hard and you used to be able to do 350 watts for five minutes or something, and it starts dropping off and there's a con commented sense of pressure build up in your legs and pain and swelling and cramping that you've never had before, be on the lookout for iliac artery endofibrosis. Um, when the symptoms get really bad, you, you know all about it. You can't put out more than about 100 watts or 150 watts. It can get really severe. Um, I've had clients who could get up to about 100 watts and then their leg would just shut down and that would cramp and it was really, really bad. So this is a surprisingly common affliction at a, like I said, at a subclinical level. Um, we've, at a, at a clinical level where it becomes performance limiting, I think it's less, it's less common, but we have had lots of pro cyclists with this condition. Um, I think uh, Amanda Spratt, the famous Australian racer, uh, Pauline ferron Provo, the mountain biker who's do doing a bit of road riding as well, Bob Jungels and Zenek Stebar and a whole bunch of others. These guys have all had surgery to relieve the complications of iliac artery endofibrosis. And it is not just limited to pros. I've seen plenty of amateurs doing like 10 hours a week who've developed this. So there's an element of genetics associated with it as well and um, how much your scar tissue forms up when you're doing this type of repetitive motion in the joints. So it is not just limited to people doing massive volume like pros. So no one knows quite how common this is. Um, I strongly suspect it's more common than people think if it's happening at a mild level. 
you would know from talking to a lot of people, um, and a lot of people watching this will know that when you get, jump on a time trial bike, it is very, very common on a TT bike to put out 10, 20, 30 watts less over a 20 minute effort than you can do on a road bike. And one of the questions you could ask yourself is why is that? Is that happening potentially because the deeper hip flexion angle on the TT bike is causing low grade stenosis or closure of the artery, which is then causing loss of circulation through the legs at a slight level, let's say a 20% reduction or 30% reduction, which it could potentially explain why so many people can put out less power in a TT position than they can in a road position. And it also explains anecdotally why a lot of people shorten the cranks on the TT bike and their power level goes up significantly. So the longer the crank is, the more kinkage of the artery you're gonna get. So traditionally, we have put this down primarily to people having difficulty holding the time trial position, just being more flexed over and that sort of stuff. But it is quite possible that you, these people are getting low grade iliac artery insufficiency or closure. And that's actually what's to blame for the power reduction. And in, therefore, it may be extraordinarily common. It might be like 50% of people. You know, It could be really, really common. And obviously that extremely deep flexed TP, TT position is quite a bit worse for the artery than being in a road bike would be. So that could explain some of the power loss that a lot of people see. Um, so what's the treatment for this? Look, positionally speaking, what we do when we've got this going on is we shorten the cranks. This is a great move to open the hip angle back up and clear the artery and open it up. We, we tend to then go into what I call damage control mode, where we would move the seat up and forward to again open the hip angle significantly. So we, we tend to run slightly higher seat heights to open the hip angle and a very high bar height. So the person ends up up and forward in the back end and really up in the front end to try and open things up. If all else fails, surgical intervention can be warranted. And I've had probably 10 to 15 people over the course of the last 12 or so years that have had to go and get this done. And what the vascular surgeons do is most of the time they, they use a combination of stents, which are little things which basically open up and hold, their, hold the artery open, and also donor arteries. So they'll pull an artery from somewhere else in your body, usually down in your lower legs, one of your saphenous veins or something, and they'll use that to actually splice in like a new artery into the section where all of the damage has occurred. So it's pretty drastic surgery, it's pretty nasty. I've seen failure rates of probably 30%, so probably one in three of them, in my experience, for the, just the clients that I've had, which again is not a lot of clients, but I've had one in three where it just hasn't done well. So it's not got amazing, uh, an amazing hit rate for the surgery, and it is a nasty type of surgery. So, you know, I've never seen one of them fail, luckily. Uh, apparently it is possible for the, um, the new arterial walls to actually split, and the, the junctions where they've sutured them together to to fail and if that were to happen that would be a life-threatening you know that you could bleed out very very rapidly like you can with a femoral artery um, dissection or something or an aortic dissection it could be life-threatening within a matter of minutes so potentially a very severe problem so something to look out for if you've got any signs of that sort of claudication going on in your legs that pressure build up and it's sort of uh, it's defying you to you know you, you can't find any way around it you don't get it when you're running but you do get it when you're cycling uh, and your position has been looked at and everything looks great biomechanically iliac artery endofibrosis is a potential you know, it's a potential diagnosis. So there are diagnostic things you can do. You can do a Doppler ultrasound and that sort of stuff. So contact your doctor and uh, get into a sports medicine specialist to have a look at it if you're worried that you've got this, because it could be a potentially serious limiter of your performance, but also something actually permanently disabling if it causes really bad closure of the arteries. So something to look out for, not a particularly nice condition. And I think it is probably way more common than we think at a low level. Like most medical conditions, this spans a spectrum, you know, and, and I think a huge number of people of, of cyclists out there have probably got it at a very low level. Not many have got it at a massively, terribly limiting high level, and there's probably a fair few people somewhere in the middle. If you've got it at a low level, are there things you can do to minimise it? So like, you know, stretches or movements or, you know... Something? <laughs> apart, not really, as okay. far as I understand. Apart from those positional things yes. that we mentioned before, yeah. I don't up. believe we we don't we just don't know. Yeah. It is it is literally the mechanical nature of our sport, flexing that hip up and down and kinking that artery. Yeah. You could maybe argue that keeping your hip flexor nice and loose would be sort of beneficial, but 
most of the time from my understanding of it, it, it is it is the kinking across the front of the hip joint that is a problem. Yep. And there's not a lot you can do about that. Yep. Yeah. Take up another sport. Take up another sport. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's hope it never comes to okay. that, mate. It's yeah. a nasty one when you get it. Yeah. All right. Thanks for your time. No worries, mate.